So, good evening. Um, this will be our recap video on the uh, idle speed air valve and that will conclude this chapter. I will go into this in a minute. Today is the first anniversary that I actually had the car here. The car got here actually on November 12th at about 6 p.m. and I had to go and pick it up and we couldn't start the car because the battery was empty. And then, so I waited until uh, the morning of the 13th and I picked the car up with a friend of mine. We jump started it and I drove the car home from the place where the uh, trucking company had dropped it off since they weren't able to come into our neighborhood. And so today I also went back to the gas station to get some things and I made it over the 333,000 mark. So the car had 331,004 miles on it. And I got now exactly 3,333,004 while it is sitting out there. So I officially drove 2,600 miles. I had to fix the speedometer, the, the mileage counter. And I did that in early December, so I may have driven 50 miles or so, 75 miles without the mileage counter actually working. But that is 2,600 official miles we got since the speedometer was repaired. And as you can see, my idle is now exactly at 700, 650, 700. And my temperature is right there where it is supposed to be. We had about 47 degrees. The wind was a lot colder today. And you also can see that 60 miles I drove since the last tank fell. I'm a little bit under quarter, which means I'm going to be about 120, 130 miles city traffic here in Kansas City uh, for half a tank or 260 miles for 20 gallons, something like this, 20, 21 gallons in that range. And just by that, you can all already tell that the car, the engine is in a pretty good shape and that it's fairly well adjusted because the first thing that goes out of the window with a bad engine, or when the engine is really off a lot, is um, your gas mileage. That is one indicator. On the highway, I do better. I get about 150 to 160 miles out of half a tank fill. That's about 300 to 320 miles out of 20 gallons. That's just on a, a side notice. You can see we have absolutely no air leaks even at the at the correct idle now. And um, what I winded up doing is, let me just show you this. So this is the good part. The car is here now one year. I had the car here one year and we're doing pretty good. Now, I wanted to show you this again. This is my original Mercedes-Benz valve I bought earlier this year. This is the valve which will close factory setting 1.4 amps as we had determined. And then yesterday I showed you in the other video, I had this valve in here, which I had adjusted to about 1.1 to 1.2, roughly in there. And you can see this, this is the valve I took out and I put in the third valve I had, which is better than this one, is better working than this one here. That's why I took this back out. And we had that flush at uh, exactly one amp. So what I winded up doing this morning, I, I did a test drive and my RPM was actually too low. So I pushed it into exactly the same position as this one here. And this one is pushed in exactly 55 mil. And one mil is one thousandth of an inch. So 55 mil, I think, is a, a 64th, is a 30 thousandths. Um, it would be a, a one thirty second of an inch, somewhere or there, thereabouts. Uh, I measured it out earlier with the calipers. It's exactly 55 mil. And that setting will get you to 1.1, 1.2 amps. And this is what you're seeing here. I have now exactly the same idle speed, whether the car is hot or warm in the operating temperature in this case, or the car is cold in, in both instances. And it starts up right away. So all the modification I have done to this point have led me now to the point that I'm at the correct setting of what I needed. This is what this should look like. It. And if your engine is in a similar uh, condition from what mine is, then you should be right there too. Again, the setting here for me, which yielded this result you're seeing is 55 mil. 
and uh, <clears throat> let's see we got a couple more things here for you with looking through it now i didn't vote for this guy i would vote for this and the flag and but no uh thank you just on the side and um well I did all of this now because here comes the first big trip sometimes I think the second week of December that's at least what the plan is right now from Kansas City from Bayshore all the way down to Oklahoma about 340 miles it's going to take me probably five hours with the usual stops here and there um, I probably will need a tank fill maybe a little bit more we will find out and exactly where we're going I would say five and a half hours is probably reasonable. If I stop somewhere for lunch, then it's going to be six hours or a little bit longer than that. Anyway, that's planned down there to meet a friend of mine. That's a long story, too. She's a young lady. She's going to college, and she is the daughter of a friend of mine who passed away in 2019. And it's a very sad story altogether, and I have been... I'm neither the father nor the stepfather nor anything else. I'm just a friend. And I have been supporting her uh, because she's not even 21 yet uh, with getting started in college. But that's a different story. So that will be the first long term trip or long trip um, with the car now in the condition it is in. And uh, so this all came about here today. Let me see. These are the two pictures. Now I have a whole bunch of more pictures. And there's a few things I wanted to detail. For one is I said in the video, I had redone my wiring. And uh, basically what I meant is, this is the valve I took out. Now this is the one I put in. This is the one we adjusted all the way out in the video. And this was from the video. And I, like I said, is I adjusted this uh, brass piece in by 55 mil now. In the video, it was flush flush with the housing out here with this part here okay and what I did is my wiring earlier this year this is actually this valve here when it had this racing thing on there this is the eBay fellow who sold it and you can see this was in the very beginning this is an old picture and I had temporarily fixed my wiring with these thin wires and um, this white wire is actually the one for the temperature gauge and I knew I couldn't leave it that way, but I had matching colors to what the uh, identifier was besides the base color on the Mercedes-Benz wiring harness. So I spliced them in, and that is the part I changed, uh, I would say about three weeks ago. I changed them out to these here, which are regular 16 or 18 gauge wires. And it can handle the temperature, so I re-spliced this. I got rid of the thin wires, and I went with more sturdy, thicker wires. And you can see I also got my vacuum switches here uh, fixed since, and everything cleaned up. Now, anyway, this is the working valve I got of eBay, and that is the one we adjusted. And like I said, this, this is now set for about 1.1, 1.2 amps. You see the difference is not very great. This one here also, now since I cleaned this, this valve here uh, is now sticky. So I have to see if I can clean this some more or what I can do with it. It will vary when it gets warm. It needs a little bit more current to close. When it is cold, it works a little bit better. And um, again, this is this plastic piece I was talking about yesterday too in the video. This is where I got the uh, six feet of my of this tubing what they use i thought this came into um in, in actually 42 millimeter pieces but uh, actually they sent that out um by three foot or one meter length so that's how i wound up with this stuff and uh, i didn't realize this when i ordered it but that's well it's not a big deal i sold to one fellow um hans christian in oregon a fellow of us here thank you very much he purchased three of them already if you want them i will put the cash app down in the description of the video one piece three dollars two pieces six dollars three pieces nine dollars they will be perfectly cut and the exact length 42 millimeters with a straight cut on both ends and you put them in while this is out outside you take this out and then you adjust it in that it goes exactly from this end 
to this end it will match exactly in there and then you can look at this when you look at this from the bottom you can see that the ends exactly stop here and stop there you don't want this protruding in because of the airflow going through and this is another thing is we're going to be talking here in a minute uh, i'm going to be explaining this this is going to be probably a longer video but anyway, the wiring, that's just something I wanted to show you. I had replaced this. If someone has ever wondered about it, why I had these little wires in there, that was what I had at hand. And I replaced this um, at a later point. Okay, now I mentioned this, uh, that my timing actually is off. And if you watch the video where I do the uh, timing chain on the fly, we started with adjusting the timing chain um, or checking the marks on the camshaft by setting the the uh, pulley on the uh, crankshaft the crankshaft pulley with the timing marks to zero exact zero is as much as you can do it because that's a pretty coarse adjustment to begin with and so that's the first thing so you're gonna crank the engine over until it goes to zero and then the first alignment mark you check is that the rotor is pressed, pushed all the way back to the end. There is the flywheel in there with the spring loaded thing. So this is going to sit here. But when you actually, you have to physically push this back when the crankshaft pulley is at zero, you have to push this in and this mark and this mark has to line up. You can then loosen the screw on the distributor and move the housing a tad bit to actually for these two to exactly meet at that point. Then you have set the ignition timing for the spark plugs correctly. And then the next mark is the mark on the crankshaft on the driver's side, which is the left side. I'm looking, you can see the timing chain here. I hope that YouTube doesn't cut this off when they're processing this. And because I took this at an angle, this rig, that, that rib here in the middle is exactly actually over it when you look at this at a different angle. So this is the one where it lines up. So we have the crankshaft pulley is lined up, the, the, uh, the timing, um, the distributor is lined up. Let me just open those up as we need them. The, the left camshaft is lined up and now, the right one is going to fall wherever it's going to fall in this process. And this is basically it. And I took this picture better from the top because you can see the mark here. This is the actual bearing unit where the thing sits in the, the whole camshaft, which is mounted into the cylinder head. And uh, this is the zero mark basically on your bottom uh, on the, on the uh, crankshaft pulley. And you can see this. We are now after top dead center. And what this actually equates to is probably one to three degrees in timing angle. Not in, in 360 degree angle, but in timing angle because the timing is spaced differently, you know, because the way the cylinders sit. So I believe this would be like your 10 degree mark here. And so you have probably five degrees would be here. So we could, we're going to be right about two or three degrees. This is the 10 degree mark here. And uh, I don't think they have one on the left, but you can see the distance from here to here. This is 10 degrees and timing degrees. And this way you can say this is about two, maybe three of, okay? Now I know this, and this would be a very easy fix because Mercedes-Benz has the Woodruff keys, which have an offset. And... Um, let me just see we're here but the issue is this that on my camshaft the current straight Woodruff key is stuck and I cannot get it out and you can see this on the new camshaft this is actually the piece which has the mark on it and that is also aligned this always has to have a straight a straight Woodruff key in it uh, for the mark to be exact and that mark has to align exactly with the top of this um, oh, knocker uh, what do you call that now in English I can't remember the English word the, on, on this part of the X shape part I, I can't remember the word sorry and then usually this is pushed forward 
and then you have it looking like this here and the second key is here now this is basically locked in place by that bearing assembly you have with the oiler in it and the problem is as soon as you take off the actual sprocket here that this whole thing can be actually pushed back and it makes it very difficult to actually trying to get this frozen wood off key out otherwise i would have fixed this a long time ago so i have now three options basically but before i go to the options i want to explain on why we actually come to this situation we know this thing is in a good shape here we know that we have the driver's side correct the left side is correct our and our pulley is correct crankshaft pulley we write all the timing lines up but why do i have now the two to three degree offset on the passenger side or on the right side which is now past the top dead center they're delayed now at this point well the problem with this is that there are several sprockets in there first of all you have the two scam camshaft sprockets you have a sprocket for the uh for the uh, distributor and you have the crankshaft sprocket and then there is another sprocket in there on the left hand like as a guide and all of those wear out. Now this engine has 333,000 miles on it and it probably had some parts replaced at one point or another. We know from the past that the unit had a broken uh, or a timing chain because these are the parts I actually found in the oil pan and the oil uh, strainer itself. And you can see on how bad they were and how brittle that was. And when you look at the pictures, you can see this. This is actually where the pin goes through on the bottom of these holder uh, of these uh, chain guides. So one of the chain guides broke. And since it is a holder like this, it is most likely the one which is on the driver's side. There's two of them on there with two pins. And it is one of them which, which went out. And that wound up in the oil strainer. Well, I'm going to get to the oil thing here in a minute. I don't have a picture of my oil strainer. Anyway, it wound up in the oil strainer. And that tells me they fixed the timing chain. They may have fixed other things on there. They put the Fabi stuff in there. I probably still have the Fabi rails in there, which are good enough at the moment. They're still in a whitish color. I showed that in the other video too, when I did the comparisons. Um... But there was a failure, and that is the part which failed. It didn't damage the engine. And uh, so they did some work, but they did not replace any of the sprockets. And I truly believe that all the six sprockets, I believe it's the total, um, are still the original sprockets which came with the engine. And even though we have a new chain tensioner, new chain and everything else on there, we still have now a two to three timing degree angle uh, offset after top that center. And um, the fix would be to get the offset wood roof key for two or three degrees. And then you rotate the camshaft back into position and the change stays. So you're basically taking the straight wood roof key out. You put the offset one in, you turn that over until that lines up then this mark is going to be in line and you have the alignment with your sprocket because of the key is basically fixed in holding in place by all the other aligned parts. And then you have no more timing issue Then everything is hunky dunky dory. But like I said, is I cannot do this because this puppy here is frozen. Now we know this, I put the, so this is at least the third chain since the other chain was a Fabi chain. This is at least the third chain, if not the fourth chain I have in this car. That's for sure, the one I put in there. <clears throat> and now my options are, <clears throat> I can pull the engine out and put new camshafts in because they're probably not really bad, but they're not really that good anymore. They're going to be somewhere in the middle, probably between good to middle, you know, somewhere in there. If you would grade it, probably a B minus. That's what I would say. Let me see if I have a picture of. Uh, I took one out of the video here. 
you can see this i have no rust marks on here there's nothing there is no no real this is just oil film stuff which is on there um and this is how they are on both sides so they're in a pretty decent shape so they may have been replaced when that car had 250,000 miles on it, maybe uh, 150,000 miles, 200,000 miles, who knows. Um, they're Mercedes-Benz uh, shafts, so they're not aftermarket, they're not Fabi, Bilstein, or anything else. These are original ones, I verified them uh, with the part numbers when you rotate them through. And all surfaces and all tops of the X-shaped things here, uh, knocking, the knocking. Um, that's what we call them in German, um, are basically in excellent shape. So if you measure it out, like I said, it's just would be qualifying for B, B, B minus part all the way through. No rust, uh, no wear, no scratch marks, nothing. Just if anything, then there's going to be some reduced, you know, size on it from just the age and mileage. Um, Going back to my options to fix this issue is I would have to replace either the camshaft. If I replace this camshaft, I have to replace the one on the other side too. That means at this point, I might as well pull the whole heads off and check all the valves and redo the valves. I did the test today, which Jean-Pierre Zimmer did in his uh, video two days ago on the 5th 560. SL they were working on this was an 86 model with like I said around 200,000 kilometers about 130,000 150,000 miles um, he goes back to the muffler and he listens and there's a blop blop noise which comes through the regular sound and that indicates that one of the valves especially the exhaust valves are out or not closing properly and that causes a a kind of misfiring when you when you hear this you know and i don't think that my valves valves are in an absolute great shape they might be in a b minus to a c plus shape at this point because otherwise i wouldn't get the mileage i'm getting but the issue i'm having so i can either replace this or i can take disassemble the the camshaft and get this thing actually i can slide this ring off because it comes right off and i can try to clamp this into a machine vise that is the ones you use to precision vise a regular bench vise is not going to work this would have to be a machine vise which is absolutely parallel uh, brackets <clears throat> uh, and you clamp the hell out of this thing basically and then start with a rubber mallet, start tapping this, this whole shaft very carefully. And then eventually it will pop out. Uh, I would not do this with heat or anything else. This is not my camshaft you're looking at. This is a picture I found because I did not take a picture of my stuck wood off key on there. And um, that is something I'm contemplating doing. But that is also a lot of work because you have to take all of the oiler uh slash bearing units out there's five or six of them i think uh, then they have to be retorqued that needs new bolts and that's an aluminum head you really don't want to do this too much on the other hand is i cannot do just drive this back here i, I thought about getting a a, a sharp metal object uh, which fits right in between the two and then just ta carefully tap this until I get into the bottom of this and then lift this thing out but this is to if there's anything goes wrong in this plus this like I said is this whole thing moves back on you uh, because that uh, sprocket actually holds it in place in center on the head assembly itself so that's a very tricky part so either new Second one, take the whole thing out, clamp this in, and then trying to get it out, or using a device and uh, uh, driving that carefully out, figuring out a way on how to actually lock that camshaft in place. That's the three options I have in order to fix it. And I had postponed this, uh, you know, when I have more time and maybe I find a different solution for this uh, to actually get that wood off key out i have all the wood off keys here the offset ones so to fix this is like an hour job at the very most all you have to do is take the two covers off 
uh, get the engine, you know, cranked over to zero. And then you do that. And uh, after that is then I can actually do then the the final um, valve leakage test. And uh, you remember I showed you this, I have this big back black Bosch thing, black Bosch uh, valve test or leakage test I bought of eBay uh, in Russia that I sent it over and I got the calibration nozzle that, that inserts in it. So you can exactly set this up for it. And the engine has to be hot. And that is the part I don't like. And I said it the other day is for that is the engine has to be hot 85 degrees or so at the full operating temperature and just getting the spark plugs out because that hose screws into the spark plug. And you have to take the camshaft covers off because you have to have that exactly in the position where the two cams for each cylinder are totally cleared with the top of their uh, two X-shaped uh, knocking. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> forgive me, uh, where the two knocking are uh, absolutely out so that the valves are fully closed and then you can actually run the air through it and it will tell you how much it bleeds. And um, so that would be then the, the last thing and then I can tell you what we need to do with the valves. And I also would check then the actual uh, clearance or if we have to use bigger or larger shims on each valve with that tester I got. So I can go through and then properly adjust all the valves back to the correct open and closing height uh, with that. I have some of the shims here, some of them I would have to order. Um, I had, when I had the, when I did the chain, I took all the lifters out. I checked all the lifters. They have virtually no wear. So they were replaced at one point or another. They're also original um, Mercedes-Benz lifters I have in there, hydraulic lifters. And I checked all the plates and all the plates are the same. And that tells me that the heads probably don't have 333,000 miles on it, but they had a head job done. And they also replaced them with new valves, intake and uh, out. And they were all set up exactly because each plate is the same. Usually when you have an older car and someone has worked on it and went through maintenance, they have different uh, shims in there because the valves wear differently between exhaust and uh, intake. Um, anyway, now that is that part when it comes to my timing to actually perfect it. Uh, like I said, is the ideal thing then would be for me to take the whole thing actually apart and take the engine actually out and take the cover off and both oil pens and then actually replace all six sprockets as well. Because then I don't need the offset Woodruff key anymore because at that point, all of these marks will align correctly. And uh, because the offset here, again, comes only from the wear and tear on the sprockets. So if I do the sprockets, I don't have to worry about the uh, offset Woodruff key and whether or not I can get that Woodruff key off or not. I could just, you know, put a straight Woodruff key on there and everything will fall back into place. And then just check the valve stuff out with the leakage. And if there's no leakage, I just adjust the clearance and we're good. And who knows for how long that's gonna last, another 50,000 miles, I don't know. I checked all my pistons as good as I could with our with my bore scope and the, the walls don't look like they have any damage, neither do the pistons. The pistons, of course, after all these years, they have a lot of carbon built up because that is a 250 horsepower engine. And with us driving here at 55, 65, 70 miles an hour on our highways here, this car has never seen any real load on the engine. So that's another reason why these cars here in America usually last long is because you don't drive these high excessive speeds of 130, 140, 150 miles an hour where you go under full load condition on these engines, which they could do. But of course, that is creating more and more wear. So if you drive at 55 to 80 miles an hour, you have very little wear on those engines normally if it is all done. And this car has never towed anything either. There's no tow hook on it, no hitch, which means it doesn't, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not labored at any time. It never had to perform any real labor. And then in Kansas, we don't have any mountains where you go up and down. Los Angeles, probably a little bit more, but for the most of it, it's pretty flat too. Anyway, so the 
other issue I have left with my oil pump, and if you remember this, I had talked about this and my oil pump in itself is actually fine. This was when I replaced my old strainer where we found all these loose parts in it. And um, when I was underneath there, I looked at the pistons. Now the oil pump is to the left and you can see this here. You can see there is some marks on here and there is an R, if I see this correctly, I should have wiped the oil up. I wasn't really that worried about it. It's on the top now. It looked like when I was underneath the car, it, I think this would be cylinder number two, and this would be the piston number two, and this is piston number one probably. So you can see someone had marked something here, and uh, either they had replaced the pistons or they had checked the pistons or there was some work performed at one point or another. And this is another reason why my engine runs the way it does. Um, I cannot fully decipher this, but we can see nine, 988. So if this is a date stamp on there, that means that is pretty much the original pistons they got in there or the piston rods at least. It's hard to tell until you actually take it apart and you clean it. And you can see this is uh, the overall condition of the engine looking in here. Of course, this is your crank uh, crankshaft here, the counter weight on it. Um, you know, and then there's the other part of it too here. So this would be cylinder one, cylinder two. Looking at this oil pump to the left, no oil pump to the right, cylinder one, cylinder two, counterweights, counterweights and then the bearings basically there was really nothing when i looked into this there was really nothing there which i could see which caused any alarm you have some you know residue on here which is normal there's no rust in there um for that that the car set for quite a few years i think this is all very acceptable and this i guess if something broke they probably fixed it but for the better part this is all original with 330,000 miles on it and then here you can see the chain and this is my problem with the oil really at this point is where the oil needle goes like this it bounces and the problem is there's a chain tension of the smallest chain in here for one is the chain has slack the chain is too long I have a new chain, I have a new oil pump, and I have a new pulley or sprocket. And the only thing I couldn't get was a new chain tensioner, but that's only a piece of metal which can be bent out a little bit, you know, to get some more tension on it. So the next time I'm going to do an oil chain, a change is when the oil is out, I will replace the oil pump because I also believe that the pressure regulator is probably out. And since we found the parts in here, from that original uh, timing chain guide, which wound up here, that tells me that this is the original pump. And after 330,000 miles, your pump will go like this. I'm pretty sure it is just worn out. So this will be the next thing on the list to get the oil flow more stabilized, which then also will increase or stabilize the oil pressure in my timing chain guide. And I think I'm going to do this probably before the Oklahoma trip. As soon as I can get the car in the shop, I will drain the oil out and we put the new oil pump in and I'm going to make a video of that too. And that will fix that issue. But then again, it's like I said, is I have not made a decision of whether I'm going to go and do the all the sprockets to fix my issue here without the offset Woodruff key. Mercedes-Benz allows you an eight degree offset, which would be about probably here. So if you transfer this over to the same side to you about here in this range from here to here. When, once it goes past eight degrees, the, the wear is so bad that you basically have to rebuild the engine at this point or some, at least the heads and everything that has to do with sprockets and chain related in there. And, uh, but with this, this is so minimal, the Woodruff key would fix it, but it will not fix the core issue, which are the worn out or wearing out sprockets, the six sprockets basically in there. In order to change the sprockets effectively, all of them, 
you will have to pull the engine and the transmission. And that would be a pretty big job. Then you have to take that off. And then when, when you do that, then you might as well go through the whole head and see if you want to reseat the valves or do this, that, or the other thing. And um, I'm going to do the Woodruff key if I can get it out first, then check the valves because I still have six degrees at least left before an overhaul, a complete engine overhaul is required. And then I will see what my valves are doing and that will also then stabilize the rough idle. As further this goes out, is more the thing bounces forwards and backwards depending upon the timing chain tensioner. And with my oil pump, you know, with the oil pressure going a little bit up and down, up and down, that of course allows for some slack in the chain minimal but you will see that and uh, that will cause a little bit of the rpm to go a little bit up and down we're talking 25 50 rpm and this is sort of what i'm seeing on the gauge uh on in my cluster you know just some minor variations in this and this is all directly related on the bottom from the old worn out oil pump and then on top here for the two degree three degree offset i got so these are the issues at hand like i said it's the uh, from the exhaust, it looks like all the exhaust valves are closing and the intake too. Um, there was one last item I wanted to uh, get into on the, um, uh, with our idle speed air valve and um, but why we would have to adjust them and why it makes sense or why it might be required. Technically, you would think if you buy them factory new, with 1.4 amp, you know, closing current, which they're set for, 1.4 amps, that they should work as you put it in the car, you would expect an engine to go down, but there's a story behind this, and that is directly related to the, <clears throat> to this type of engine. Now, you remember my big engine repair, I took the um, entire intake manifold out, and the intake manifold has two parts, the lower one, on, on the lower one, you get these uh, O-ringed donuts on there, which connect to the top bridge, which they call that. And the bridge actually fumbles then the suction down into the lower part, where it then goes through the throttle. Um, and then from the throttle into the rubber boot, and in the rubber boot, it goes up out to your um, fuel fuel distributor, regulator, fuel distributor. And of course the idle speed air valve sits on here too. And that's basically on how this works. So this front part of the idle speed valve sits right in your boot on top and it is above the throttle, but it is below the air, the fuel distributor, the airflow meter, the uh, divider, what they call it in Germany. And so what actually happens is this part here with that rubber piece goes to that connector over here. And you have this hose is connected to it and your cold start valve injects into this. And this one actually on that bridge is going directly to the intake you see here on your right hand side of cylinder number five. And this is also where the port is where you plug in that vacuum line for your EZL, for your ignition unit. So the entire idle speed operation, including the advance is all because it is the closest and direct air intake vacuum port basically, is cylinder number five. And the way this works is um, when this thing is open, the vacuum is sucked in through. That vacuum goes up to the underside of your plate and the throttle is closed at this point. So this thing actually, draws the air that draws all the air through from here going straight into cylinder number five with the uh, fumes from all eight fuel injectors you get these little uh, hose hookups on these and they suck this air through minimal uh, there's a high vacuum on there and they will go in here with this hose and this hose together, this all within that in uh, cold start valve, that all goes directly into cylinder number five, primarily because it is the closest port. And that's where this entire system basically works off. And now you can see um, 
when this thing closes, basically, the plate will go up. You have less fuel, uh, fuel flowing in there, which is going to throttle the whole system back. And if you open it up, the plate comes down and it goes from here. It's sucked in the, the vacuum, vacuum from top going in here into cylinder number five. If cylinder five is a little bit off, in this case it isn't, because we know with our marks from the camshaft that we're right on the money with the uh, distributor and our uh, crankshaft pulley, basically. Uh, they're all in the exact position, so this starts everything up, and so is your vacuum for your EZL. But over time, of course, in the way I'm the vacuum here may not be as good as on a factory new engine. And this is what I suspect, that on a factory new engine, or say like an engine with 50,000 miles, or 75,000, even 100,000 probably, um, 50,000, pretty sure, will have still enough vacuum here that the minimum air gap here basically is regulates itself down. So at one amp, you have a minimum airflow which keeps the plate at a certain position and that will work off this vacuum here and that will be then enough. Um, when the system ages and that vacuum gets less or the engine idles to high, then I suspect that the, uh, the five cylinder doesn't have enough vacuum anymore. Um, or produces not enough vacuum and that the other cylinders at that point start drawing it because when you actually watch it when you crank the engine over say like you take all spark plugs out and you're cranking the engine over you will see the plate actually boop, 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 boop. And this is exactly when you would put the timing mark on this is, correlates exactly to cylinder number five and in this process when they are starting to leak um, if the vacuum goes from the other side and draws over to the left to the right bank actually then you have less vacuum here because it's a balanced vacuum system and because i'm past top that center on my right hand camshaft this would create a counter vacuum in the other direction or prolonged where there's not enough vacuum here anymore and this is why i had to adjust my air idle speed air valve down from 1.4 amps to about 1.1 1.2 so that is the offset because like i said it's, it's a subtraction sub, a subtracting and adding and if one port opens up faster or sooner then you're gonna have the vacuum drawn different in these channels because they're all you're going crisscross basically and you will have a offset in there where either the vacuum becomes too high or the vacuum becomes too low. And that depends on when the intake valves are actually open in sequence. And in order for this to be happening is five would be open, but also one of the left would either be open too late or open too, too soon. One of the four cylinders, which interferes now with five. And that creates less vacuum here in order to uh, to keep the idle speed or it creates more vacuum actually um, and that will draw with this gap it is that way you're going to have more it is an addition in this case that you will have more vacuum because this is open and this is open so you have two intake valves open uh, and that is going to have with the default gap here at 1.4 amps which you have in here uh, i don't didn't bring my flashlight that will get your idle speed up and since that varies with temperature when it gets warmer then that means that the valves will stay open longer and create more vacuum so the entire system actually your, your plate is going to go further down now what most people do is they turn the plate now counterclockwise trying to get it back up but then your mixture control is going off so you're not getting the right mixture but the actual imbalance comes from the vacuum system and like i said is again is the vacuum is drawn from here into that port which screws on the top bridge and the closest port is five and then they have a cross connection over to the rear and when these leak on the back side when they don't close and open correctly then you have a double vacuum you get like 100 percent vacuum here and 10 20 30 percent extra vacuum for one of the rear cylinders here because the way they go across on that spider web almost looking 
upper manifold, what they call that. And that will increase the vacuum on here. And with the standard gap at 1.4, you have to close this further to compensate for the additional vacuum you're getting from the right bank. And that is the best way I can explain this. And this is only applicable to those folks which have a normal idle, say like around 650, 750, when the engine is cold, but the idle goes up to 1,000 when the engine gets warm because this issue is gonna increase as warmer that gets and you're more, you know, your valves are a little bit loose and the, the timing, uh, you know, the, the camshaft doesn't, uh, is delayed. Uh, then you have them overlapping and you get more vacuum going and that increases with temperature, engine temperature. And that also causes part of the rough idle at times because it depends on where this is at with your mixture control from the EHA valve because the EH, unfortunately the ECU system in this car or on these engines, this is also applicable for the 4.2 liter, uh, do not get any vacuum feedback. The, the only unit which gets a vacuum feedback is the EZL. And when that happens is, uh, the vacuum port also gets a higher vacuum and you can see this when the engine is cold you're at 15 inch mercury and when the engine gets warm it goes up to 20 inch mercury and that comes because now you have two overlapping intakes uh, five or because it is the closest port here so that's the, the dominant vacuum is five um, the other ones then will add to the vacuum to it and that will go you can see this it might be two and a half five uh, inch mercury we're not talking huge numbers here but that is the offset and then the the uh, EZL will idle uh, will also go up and like I said it's the way I combated this in my case with the condition of my engine the way my intake valves are this boils down to an adjustment where you want to be 55 mil or about 130 second I think that's what 55 mil is that is 0 0.055 inches. That's 55 mil. So an eighth of an inch is 125 mil. So it's half of an eighth of an inch or thereabouts. You know, that might help you a little bit uh, to better picture this. And I believe uh, I don't do much with fractions. I'm an electrical engineer. We don't work much with fractions. So if you have 0.125 half of it, is uh, 60 is 120 62 and a half so 62 and a half so whatever half is of uh, one eighth that would be a sixteenth two sixteenths is one eighth so two sixteenths a sixteenth a little bit less uh, than a sixteenth of an inch so three thirty seconds one thirty second two thirty seconds is a sixteenth yeah, it is somewhere around there. I, I just go with 55 mils. That's easier for me. I put the thing on there, it says 55 mils on the dial. I know what we're talking about. So, and with that, I think we have covered it. This is the exact explanation of why your engine is acting the way it is. If you wanna fix this, the first thing is like in my case, I would have to get the right camshaft back exactly to top that center. I have to eliminate this that it is after top that center and go back to normal. That will probably reduce the vacuum here by two to three inch mercury. Figure about, I would say from what my experience is now, for each degree and timing angle offset on one of the camshafts, you get at least one additional inch mercury out. So if you're five degrees off, you will get five inch mercury more on this port here on the side. Five inch mercury also then with the same gap here will increase your idle speed because the five inch mercury are gonna pull your plate off if the internal uh, gap is not closed by pulling the spring out. So the unit can actually has more the control unit has only one amp. So you have to extend this out to reduce this further by the amount of additional vacuum, the engine timing chain valve issue is gonna create. 
and this probably has been one of the longest videos I have made, but I found that important. Um, the other thing is I wanted to say is from the statistics I have been seeing and reading is that the uh, that over 50% of my viewers un are under the age of 40. That was really as a surprise. Um, the rest, uh, the other 50% is pretty much well split equally between the age groups. And um, but um, the the biggest uh, viewer cycle in that age group from, from 18 to 40 is actually in the 18 to 28 or 29, however they had broken it up, bracket that is a larger segment than the one which goes from that point to 40. So that is something I'm really, really happy about that you young folks are interested in learning this stuff and I will do my utmost to support you. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. There's there's never a wrong ask, uh, question to ask. The, the only wrong question you can ask is the question you, you don't ask. And if I don't know, we may have someone else who knows the answer for this. And that basically concludes it. I will keep you now posted with my oil chain. Like I said, is that's going to come first with the next oil change. And then I'm going to figure out I have to think about this some more of what I'm going to do with that stuck Woodruff key on my right camshaft. If I can get the Woodruff key off, I don't want to damage the camshaft. I will put the offset Woodruff key on there and then do the uh, valve leakage test. And I hope I'm not going to burn myself up on this. Like I said, you got to take all of the stuff apart while the engine is hot. You got to take valve covers off, cylinders, uh, uh, spark plugs out. And then you have to go through and and uh, screw that hose into each cylinder into the spark plug hole and then uh, do the testing and uh, you have to then crank that over you have to go on there with the ratchet and all of the stuff is hot and you got right the exhaust underneath there where you need to get to and of course that's the hottest part and if you don't work fairly fast and if you start on cylinder one when the thing is still hot say like at 75 degrees celsius by the time you get to eight you're going to be at 50 degrees celsius or 40 degrees celsius which means none of these uh, measurements you got you got to start the whole thing all over again so this is a more cumbersome undertaking um, the other thing is oh um, what uh, Jean Pierre uh, pointed out when they did their 560 was this long uh, cavity here this rectangular cavity is an exhaust part and this builds up with carbon and I scratched this out with that little needle thing I had there I spent two hours leaning into the engine bay with the vacuum cleaner scraping all of this built up carbon in here out for this to get the airflow to go and the other thing is if you fix this the gaskets which go on here they have water going through this there's a water port on each side outside here there's two water ports in the middle and one two in the back the mercedes-benz gasket cost eleven dollars and they have the correct sealant on the side which goes to the bridge, on, actually on both sides. The person who worked on this bought the cheap gaskets, which did not have the sealant on it, and they smeared RT, RTV uh, compound around the sealant around it on both on the front sides because that's where it was leaking because they didn't screw or tighten up the uh, screws in the correct sequence. You have to start from the middle out one, two, three, four, five, six, and then you go out. There's a sequence to this. Always from the middle out to the ends, alternating in the direction and sides. This way you relieve the pressure evenly. Anyway, when they did this, whatever they did, this was leaking. So they went back in and they smeared silicone in there. It took me another hour to, to scrape out all the silicone, that red silicone, what had gone, especially here on the right-hand side in there. And I went in with that little uh, miniature vacuum cleaner thing I got in there and with the wire brush and I brushed this whole thing out as deep as I could and I went in with the bore scope to make sure I got all the uh, silicone out. I mean, as people out there, they work on these cars and this is the, the cheap gaskets at $3, the Mercedes-Benz gas, uh, gaskets are $11 a piece. And this is all, all because of eight 
$8 difference, that $16 difference that created over an additional hour at work. And you really have to sit there and you have to lean in it. And then, uh, like I said, is with that wire brush, I got, I, I got all of the stuff out and the vacuum ran constantly. I put the ear protectors on because after 15 minutes of uh, 12 an hour of running the vacuum cleaner, the shop vacuum, you know, with the small nozzle attachments to this to get in there uh, was a nightmare. And then I went in with the bore scope and I checked this. So if you have an engine and you're getting to this point, you want to get the bore scope and get into all of these openings for your water flow and check if there's any RTV sealant in there from some guy who had to think that they had to fix this and buy the cheap gaskets and put RTV uh, sealant in there. Um, this is these rectang rectangular ones you can see. That is all the water which goes through this bridge forwards and backwards because also the temperature sensors and the two uh, temperature switches, vacuum switches are on there as well. And I, I scooped all of that RTV compound out of that thing too. That took another two hours. The gasoline, uh, my gasoline bath, I did to clean this, uh, resolve most of it, but that was, uh, that was a major act. That was, I spent four hours at least cleaning the carbon out of this stuff and getting rid of the RTV compound or uh, sealant I had in all the, the upper bridge and on the uh, cylinder heads itself. Uh, it was quite a quite a job, uh, you know. I just wanted to mention this. This is the stuff you need to watch out for. Otherwise, um, I will report as we go along, and you have a great night.